Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackle for Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, where those videos are available to watch anytime afterward. If you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Remember that admission to these museums is free on Sundays, and this Sunday, August the 6th, at 2.30 p.m., we'll have the year's final edition of our summer music series, featuring a traditional Irish folk band, Emerald Accent. I note with sadness the death of John O'Hear, an archaeologist who worked for many years at the Feltus Mounds site in Jefferson County and gave a fantastic History's Lunch presentation in 2014 on the Mississippi Mound Trail. I hope you'll join us next week for History's Lunch when Mark LaFrancis, Robert Morgan, and Daryl White will screen their documentary, Women of the Struggle, Facing Fear in the Civil Rights Era. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Paul Cartwright, Jean Horton, and Tricia Nelson to present Copiah County's Bicentennial, a history from 1823 to 2023. Paul Cartwright is a retired library administrator. He earned his BA in history from Hendricks College and his MLS from the University of Southern Mississippi. Cartwright is the author of Among the Truck, Truck Farming in Hazelhurst, 1903 to 1935, and the local history booklets, History of Kapaya, Recollections of an Old Citizen, Rising from the Ashes, Sparks from Fire, 1904, and Old Communities and Landings of Yazoo, City, of Yazoo County. Gene Horton is a retired pastor with a special interest in the history of communities where he served local churches. Since retiring to Crystal Springs, he has focused on the development of transportation during Mississippi's territorial and antebellum years. Tricia Nelson earned her BS in paralegal studies and MBA from Mississippi College and her MA in historic preservation from the Savannah College of Art and Design. She's a featured writer for the Kapaya Monitor newspaper and author of several books about Kapaya County, most recently, Kapaya County Historic Postcards. And the trio have collaborated on the book, A Shared History, Kapaya County, Mississippi, 1823 to 2023. We'll hear first from Paul, then from Tricia. Um, Jean is gonna come up and use some of the uh, slides from Trisha's PowerPoint, and then she'll come back up to wrap it up, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Thanks for being here. Help me welcome Paul Cartwright to the stage. I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, be here at the archives. Um, this project sort of began uh, when I was first a library director um, in Kapai County in 93. Um, in amongst time, I had time to, in meetings in Jackson, I would come over to the archives and do research and managed to eventually copy a lot of Kapai records and things out of the archives collection and also gather stuff out of the newspapers, um, you know, in the, the various Kapai newspaper titles. But um, long story short, this project eventually uh, during my career, uh, sat in my files, and then when I completely retired in uh, 10 and we were back in Kapai County, I started compiling a lot of these um, various newspaper articles. Some of the stuff, uh, for instance, a whole series of histories were published in the Hazelhurst paper about communities in uh, Kapai County. Um, in 1957 and so that kept me busy transcribing that material for quite some time into digital format and you know in amongst that there were a lot of other materials um, that I was I used to compile into the book um, and then I collaborated with uh, Patricia and uh, Reverend Horton uh, various portions of the book that are were outside my wheelhouse. I was, you know, good at compiling and editing the material. Um, get back to my notes here. The intent originally behind the book was to not only, you know, provide a lot of historical details, um, but also give access to records of both 
white families and black families um, in the, co the county history. Um, Kapai had a, a large antebellum culture and uh, Gallatin and Mount Washington were two of the antebellum communities that were, there was a great deal of activity and they were in a, an access that'll be talked about later as far as a lot of travelers came through there by stage coke and it was a postal route. Um, so in 1850 and in 1860, um, each year, I mean each decade, there were approximately 600 different um, slave owners and then of course in the slave census it desails out the uh, numbers of those, but um, just being in Kapai County over the years, I can immediately trace family names in amongst black families back to early days. Uh, and, uh, you know, going back to deeds, I could, you know, you could probably find a great deal of more material. Um, in addition to that, you know, I provided, there's appendices in the book that list all of those the names and their indexed as well. And then um, one of the chapters in the book it deals with uh, soldiers that were listed in the uh, 1930s uh, WPA records. Um, they were black Confederates that, there were about 40 soldiers that actually fought with their owners from Kapaya County. And some of them had, you know, illustrious careers that, um, you know, further, you know, on with uh, uh, the book, there's information, you know, on rivers and streams where a lot of the settlers would settle into communities and those community histories have locations near rivers and streams. Um, and a lot of that material came out of the WPA records that were done in 1936 and 37. So portions of the book I take from that as well. And then uh, in addition to that, there are a lot of, of good bit of uh, material that I was able to glean from the um, Historic Preservation Department. Some of their scholars had very good analysis histories of some of the communities that I did not have access to and so I Gave, was given permission to incorporate that into the book. And it's all fit noted and so forth. But rather, the index alone took uh, quite a while to compile. Uh, but, you know, there's uh, lots of stories um, of early Kapaya County um, in Indian settlements and other settlements along the Pearl River um, as people migrated, but um, other than that, um, I think I'm turn it over to Patricia. She has the. A lot of this will make a lot more sense when you see the PowerPoint. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, I. Uh, I'm so honored to be here and to present to you something that has been a project that I've wanted to do for a while. And so Kapai County is celebrating our bicentennial 200 years this year in January officially. And I decided that this year I was going to pull out my collection of postcards. I have about 200 postcards from Kapai County and didn't realize I had that many until I started counting. And I said, I want to put together a book. This is the year to do it. So that's what I did. I pulled out, I sorted, I compiled. And so today we're going to look at uh, some of the postcards that are in my book that uh, just came out a couple of months ago. Uh, but the first part of this, we're going to go over how did we actually get to uh, the formation of the county. This is Paul's book, the cover of his book and his information, and this will be one of the last screens that we have, so if you're not able to get a book today, uh, you will be able to have that information and can get one hopefully later. And then this is the book that I put together on the historic postcards. I've written a couple of books on Kapai County, but 
Uh, this one is uh, by far, I really enjoyed putting together this one just because of the nature of postcards. So I really enjoy postcards because postcards are just a snippet in time. And to me, they're better than photographs because a photograph is one item that somebody can put in their shoebox, they can put in their album, they get thrown away, never see them again, okay? But postcards, a lot of times, they made multiple copies of postcards. People sent postcards, and I've collected postcards for about 15 years. People say, well, where did you get all these postcards? Well, a lot of them came from eBay. And over 15 years, you can amass quite a collection. So I'm not going to say that I have every postcard, but I probably have about 98, 99% of the postcards out there. Do not bet against me. <laughs> if I want a postcard, I'm going to get it. Now, I've paid a pretty penny for a few of them, but I've gotten some steals on some others. So I think it kind of all works out in the end. So uh, this is the cover of my new book. I have a few copies with me today, and if you're not able to get one, please contact me if you'd like one. Okay, so we're going to start out with um, the territorial, uh, Mississippi Territory, and of course you all know this is Mississippi and Alabama eventually, and then um, Mississippi became a state in 1817, and so then we see some of the counties formed in the southern part of the state. Uh, obviously, Kapai County not there yet, nor Hines. And then here we see uh, Hines actually is the large green area on the left. And then we have Choctaw lands in the center outlined in yellow. And then we have Chickasaw lands at the top in the blue. Kapai County will come from a southern portion of this green area of Hines County. And here you can see it actually laid out a little better with the counties. Um, large, uh, Hines being a very large portion of that at the time. And so from the southern part, you had um, Kapai County formed in 1823, January 21st. Then you have Hines in the center, and then you had Yazoo County actually formed. Now, I highlight this county. Does anybody know what this county is? Everybody's like, what county is that? That would become Covington County, but that's called Bainbridge County. And so for one year, 1823 to 1824 in January, uh, there was a county called Bainbridge, named after some U.S. Navy commander at the time, okay? Uh, I've done a little bit of research. What happened to this county? Don't know why they changed it to Covington, but they did. So for one year, I just thought that was pretty interesting. There was one county, <laughs> Bainbridge, that disappeared. Okay, and so... Uh, in 1824, uh, Simpson County was taken from the eastern portion of what was Kapai County. Oh, and so I'm going to back up one because I don't need to go any further before I allow Gene Horton, Reverend Horton, to come up here and talk about some transportation routes that existed during the time. And then I will be back in a few minutes. Mine runs all the way through to uh, the modern time. Do you want me to go the whole way or... Yeah, if what I'm asking, my modern times. Yeah, okay, that'd be great. Good afternoon. My name is Gene Horton. I'm, a, as introduced a few moments ago, I'm a retired Methodist pastor, and for the last 40 years, I've had the privilege of uh, traveling far and near through the state of Mississippi and living in many different communities. And uh, one of my favorite things to do to understand the community was to study its history and its people and how things got like they were. And for me, transportation was always very important. If you knew the transportation story, then you knew how the uh, area, the community, got started and why it's like it is now. So uh, as Trisha has told us, um, Kapai County was formed and... Uh, we're celebrating uh, its uh, birthday now, a 200th birthday. And it came in 1820 from a Choctaw and uh, United States treaty called the Treaty of Doak Stan. And about five and a half million acres was transferred, and most of it became uh, over seven different counties, and Kapai County was one of those. 
and uh, so we got our start in that in that time. Uh, no one lived there. Very few people lived in Kapaya County in the early 1820s when it first started. Uh, but very shortly, great numbers came. And the way they got there, the transportation by which they got there, I think is very important to note. Uh, in the early years, most people walked. Now, that sounds pretty pedestrian, but that's how they got there. They walked. And uh, they would come from different parts of the nation, but primarily from the eastern seaboard. In fact, uh, the largest number of people that settled Kapaya County originally uh, came from Virginia and uh, the Carolinas and also from uh, other areas around Georgia, Tennessee, other areas like that. And they would walk in and buy, buy land from the federal government that was available and start a homestead. And uh, one man that I highlighted in my uh, chapter, his name was John Hales. Uh, he was a farmer and a herdsman, uh, which is very, very common in that time, from the Darlington area of South Carolina. And he walked to Mississippi. It took him and his wife a better part of two months. And they, uh, by, 18, by 1813, they were in Mississippi, and they lived for the rest of his life, some 19 years longer. And uh, he spent uh, a lot of different places, Franklin, Kapai, Simpson, Smith County, but he spent about 10, nine years in Kapai County. Uh, but he was very, very uh, typical of the people that moved in and their walking. Now, how did they get here? What roads did they use? Um, well, most of them, as I said, came from the eastern seaboard, especially the Carolinas. Uh, Scots Irish was a lot of uh, took up a lot of them, and uh, they would have come. If I got that, there we go. They would have come in. Uh, most of them on what was called the Federal Road, and I want to talk about the Federal Road for just a second. Uh, it was a road. That, I've got a good map, a map of it in uh, the book. And the road uh, actually came from the eastern seaboard and made its way through Georgia and Alabama and eventually uh, came into uh, Natchez in Adams County. And it crossed Kapai County, right below Kapai County, coming in. And um, so that would have been a way the people from the east probably would have come. When they got to uh, over into Alabama in a, a fort called, community called St. Stephen's, there was a second road that went across uh, to Adams uh, County, and that's, they would have come very close to Kapai County. Uh, highway 84, modern Highway 84, uh, is a pretty close replica of the old federal road. Uh, now, as I said, most people walked, and uh, that was the way they got around. Um, they, wherever they lived, where they needed to do, they walked, they rode horses or, or wagons. But that was a primary form of transportation. And uh, it stayed that way. Uh, the walking and the, the roads that they used, which were very poor roads. Uh, we, in fact, uh, by our modern standards, we probably wouldn't call what they walked on and what they rode on roads. We'd call it pig trails, <laughs> something like that. But uh, that was the way they got around. In the Kapai County, that system of roads, although it improved somewhat, uh, remained very poor. And it stayed that way up into the early 1900s. And uh, at that time, something happened to change it all. And I'm going to talk about that some more in a few moments. But what happened was the automobile. And with the coming of the automobile, uh, the roads had to be improved. And that was when that happened. So how did they get around if they couldn't depend upon the roads? Well... Uh, one way was steamboats, uh, something that I learned in my, in my research on this. On the Pearl River, which runs along the uh, eastern boundary of Kapai County, uh, right at, right at, whoop. Trisha, am I going the wrong way? I'm all getting lost here. I don't know, is it not doing it? Get that for me. Where were we on? Ah, there we go. That one. Right. Yeah, there you go. That'll work right there. All right, thank you. Uh, along the um, eastern boundary of Kapai County runs the Pearl River. The Pearl River runs from uh, up in uh, 
through most of the central portion of south central portion of Mississippi and it flows into the uh, Gulf of Mexico down around Purlington and uh, we found out that uh, river boats used to ply up and down the Pearl River this was especially in the 1830s and 40s and 50s and uh, they ran there was five or six that ran regular routes uh, that serviced all the way from Purlington down on the Gulf Coast up to Jackson and uh, one of a few of those stopped at Georgetown which is in Kapai County uh, so that was another way that people moved around and how uh, how things were uh, cargo was moved and uh, the river boats became very prominent and they stayed that way uh, on the Pearl River they're much smaller than ones that we think of on the Mississippi River but nonetheless they moved people and cargo and they pretty much were used up until the Civil War and then they had been a trains, and that kind of did in, did in the, uh, the river boats. Uh, many of them were destroyed during the Civil War. Uh, the next group or next type of transportation that came to us was railroads. And really that changed the map for Kapaya County. Uh, the New Orleans, Jackson, and Great Northern Railroad was the first one to be put through our county, and it ran right through the, the center of Kapaya County. Uh, it became later on the Illinois Central, and in today it's the, uh, the uh, Canadian National Railroad, so we still have that one. And it was completed in March of 1858, and after that it changed the face of the way things went on in, uh, in Kapaya County. Uh, one of our biggest industrial uh, resources back in the 1870s and 80s was the Wesson Mills. It was the number one employer in the county and one of the biggest employers in all the state. And it was located in Wesson, and um, I'm sure the reason it was there was because of the train. They were able to move in and out heavy equipment. And uh, also in Kapaya County in the late uh, 1890s up into the early 1900s, 1920s, and 30s, uh, we also were a big truck cropping area. And uh, many, many boxcars of, uh, of various kinds of uh, vegetables were sent north. Uh, the king of our, of our vegetables is always tomatoes. And that was the number one thing that we, uh, we shipped north. And I had a, a little thing I ran into here. In 1927, the Illinois Central Railroad shipped 3,614 boxcars of tomatoes north to Chicago or areas around Chicago. And Illinois Central was, uh, was really instrumental in all of this. They developed refrigerated um, boxcars using slabs of ice and uh, double-walled um, uh, boxcars that had sawdust in between them. And uh, they also helped uh, to develop the farmers and develop the uh, packing and all that needed to be done in that. So. Uh, the Illinois Central the, um, became a very important part of our county. We had two other railroads that also serviced us, one on, uh, called the Natchez, and Jackson, and Columbus. And it was on the western side, and just a very poor, small portion of it went through Kapai County, but that line connected uh, Natchez to, uh, to Jackson, and our people on the western side used it a lot. It started in 1879 and they um, dis disbanded in 1981. And then the third line was New Orleans, uh, Great no New Orleans Great Northern that ran from Slidell, Louisiana up to Jackson. It was completed in 1909 and uh, closed in uh, 1980. And that particular line ran along the eastern side of our county and was very important. So railroads provided our transportation. They gave great freedom to people. Uh, before, they had to walk or ride a horse, and it was kind of limited in where they could go and what they could do. Uh, but with the railroads, things changed a lot. My wife uh, is a native of Crystal Springs, and uh, she ran across a diary of her grandmother uh, as a young woman in her uh, high school years and places that she traveled in the summer, and it was all by train. And uh, it was very interesting to read it. And she went all over Louisiana, uh, Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, over into the Carolinas. And this was all by way of train. And she was able to do that very quickly and very safely. Uh, the train that ran through Crystal Springs in the central part of, 
of Kapaya County really became a commuter train for many folks on weekends. They would go into Jackson, just like we get on I-55 and come into Jackson, or they'd go on the train. And there's one citation of a, of a local historian that said in the year 1907 that uh, one day they sold 300 tickets from uh, Crystal Springs to Jackson. So a lot of people were going, going north. Uh, the final part of our transportation story is modern highways. As I said before, we had a very, uh, very poor highway system, and that was pretty much the case. People relied on trains. And then uh, in the early 1900s, the automobile came into existence. It became very popular. Uh, the first record we have of an automobile in um, Kapaya County is an uh, uh, ordinance that was passed by Crystal Springs. And this was in 1910. And the ordinance said that uh, automobiles in the city of Crystal Springs could travel uh, no faster than 15 miles per hour on straight roads and seven miles per hour on curbs. So we know that there were roads that required ordinances that far back. Uh, by 1920, uh, automobiles became very popular. Over nine million automobiles and trucks in the United States, and surprisingly, there were 68,000 automobiles and trucks in Mississippi. And that was the year 1920, way back, and they continued to grow. And I was surprised in uh, my research to find that even during the Depression, when you would think that people would not be buying cars, uh, the number of cars registered each year continued to grow. So we Americans have loved our cars, even when we were poor, we figured out a way to buy them. Uh, one, you know, two important things happened uh, I want to close with. One was the Federal Act of 1921, uh, which had the idea that they wanted to create a standardized highway system throughout the United States. And uh, they chose a certain number of highways in each of the states. And in Mississippi, uh, we had five chosen uh, to be a part of this federal program to build a two-lane hard surface road. Um, in uh, Kapaya County, the road that, uh, that came through our county that was in a part of that system was Highway 51. It's still there in many parts. And uh, many states chose to begin their program. It was a... a paid for partially by the federal government, but they began their program by gravel roads with upgraded bridges, and then a few years later, uh, they came back and did paving in order to save money. And uh, so uh, interesting aside to that is that uh, there is a bridge at this very moment being taken down on Highway 51 in central Kapaya County that was a part of that uh, gravel road system way back in the 1930s. And this particular bridge that's gone by now was built in 1934, and it served for 89 years and is being taken out this uh, summer to be replaced. So I, I know we have to have progress, but I was kind of thinking it's, it's sad to see that go after all those years and so many people who would pass over it. Of course, a big program that uh, influenced us was the interstate highway system, and we um, in Kapaya County received... Um, Interstate 55, it runs right through the middle of our county. Uh, it was completed in 1968, and it really changed the county in many ways. It, uh, it uh, revitalized our industry, uh, but much as anything, it turned us into a bedroom community. So, so everybody lives in Crystal Springs and then drives the Jackson area, the greater Jackson area, for jobs, and that's, that's growing. Uh, more and people are coming into Kapaya County now for that very reason and commuting back. So um, transportation, someone has defined it as being the movement of goods and people from one point to another. And that uh, certainly has happened in Kapaya County. It began with walking and horses and wagons, then the river boats, and then the railroads, uh, then the gravel roads, and then finally into multi-lane modern highways that we call interstate highways. What will happen next, I don't know but I'm kind of excited to look forward to it and see how they change transportation once again. Thank you. There you go. Okay, from here on out, we're going to look at uh, postcards from the collection, and uh, I will refer back to a few things that uh, Reverend Horton alluded to. 
Uh, one thing we're going to talk about is Brown's Wells. So I know that you all know that there were several resorts in Mississippi, health resorts. They were popular back in the late 1800s, early 1900s in the state. And one of those was Brown's Wells that we had in Kapai County uh, to the west of Hazelhurst. And uh, this resort uh, began really in the 1860s when E.C. Briscoe discovered that there were mineral well waters on the property. And he gave the property to his daughter, a Miss Stockton, and by this point they had decided to build a big seven-room cottage and then offer other little uh, small cottages uh, on the property. And uh, to start marketing the property for the uh, waters, that uh, they found. And so they hosted a lot of people. If you were anybody, you came to this resort. They had lawyers, doctors, bankers, governors, and they would put in the newspapers who had arrived at Brown's Wells this week. And so uh, I have a subscription to newspapers.com, and I love it because you can find these ads for the resort in there, and they say, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so arrived at the resort today, you know, and it was this big, long list of people. And so you just never know what you might find in there, but um, everybody went to the resort. After Miss Stockton's death, the property passed into the hands of several people, and they invested money, and they made improvements, and so they brought in electricity and water and sewage. And so each room of the 50-room hotel, I don't know about you, that's a pretty big hotel to be out in the, uh, on this property, and 20-room annex open to the outside, had a large fireplace, had private baths and toilets. And that's saying a lot for the early 1900s. Um, so you can see how large this building was. Living room of the hotel had a large six-foot fireplace. They had a bowling alley, pool tables, tennis, a dancing pavilion, swimming pool, golf. So this was a really nice place. In its heyday, the 20-acre resort was beautifully wooded with trees and tropical shrubberies, and they enjoyed unsurpassed cooking with vegetables grown in the garden and meat raised locally. Sounds pretty good. I want to go there. <laughs> and so this is the front of the hotel at one point, and you can see those early cars there, and you can tell that it's quite large. Uh, and the waters cured supposedly many ailments, uh, and you can read these, but, you know, chronic constipation, uh, let's see, ulcerations of the stomach and intestines, uh, chronic diarrhea and dysentery, uh, liver problems, jaundice, acute and chronic inflammation of the kidneys in its first and second stages, Bright's disease, and uh, the bladder and the prostate. And I'm like, wow, we could all use some of that water, right? <laughs> This is um, one of the wells, one of the covers for the wells, and there were numerous wells on the property. And uh, here's a postcard uh, showing the golf activities. And this was the, uh, the lounge within the, the big hotel. And then this is the veranda, which looks really nice, a big covered area. And then the lobby with the six-foot fireplace. Unfortunately, a fire destroyed the hotel in the 1930s, and it was never rebuilt. Um, but then the property was eventually bought by an R.E. Sanders. Uh, and before we move on, I'll tell you that um, the family kept the property, but they never rebuilt that hotel. It's going to dwindle because, I mean, you know, the hotel kind of keeps it all going, right? And so um, it dwindled down and uh, eventually just faded out and everything was torn down. And now you go and look at the property, there's nothing. You would never know that that existed. But I say this because the postcards are there. We can see what existed. If we didn't have those postcards... I really haven't seen hardly any photographs of this place. We would not have this information to tell us um, and show us all of these things that existed on that property. That's why I love postcards. Okay, now we get on to um, the Hennington Campground Chautauqua Park. So the Chautauqua movement, I'm sure some of you know, started in New York. And we had our own Chautauqua movement here in Mississippi, and it was in Crystal Springs at Chautauqua Park. 
It started out, though, as the Hennington campgrounds. And so the Hennington family had this property, and they would have these Methodist uh, revivals and camps and things on the property. And so it eventually involved, evolved into a Chautauqua, which that movement was cultural, religious, political, and I call it the Neshoba County Fair of Kapai County. Okay? And it's very similar, and you're going to see why, because they had all these cottages on this property, just like you see now at the Shenoba County Fair. And so um, they would come out and stay in these cottages. They had a hotel, and uh, it was a, uh, a great time. And once again, anybody who was somebody, you came to these Chautauqua assemblies that they would hold throughout the year. And uh, there was a lake that was built, and it was to provide water for the uh, railroad, the steam locomotives. The railroad line is very close to the park. And so what they did was they built this lake in 1895, completed 1897, and um, water was pumped down to the railroad line. And, of course, this allowed a lot of people to be able to come into the park and stay in these cottages and things so the transportation was there for them to get to this lake. And then this is the hotel, one of the best postcards that we have at the front of the hotel. Um, and uh, again, so they could come and stay in the hotel or they could stay in the cottages. People own those cottages. Uh, this is overlooking the lake. This was Lover's Bridge, which unfortunately is, has been um, torn down uh, and now I'll say that there's a big amphitheater project going in. So talk about progressing to modern times. But And this was a bandstand. And a lot of these things that we see in the postcards, they are no longer there. Fire, torn down, what have you. Uh, and in 1916, there's a brochure that provides the names of at least 58 owners of cottages or bungalows, most of them owned by the locals. The rooms at the hotel were 75 cents, and the meals in the restaurant were 50 cents. And a hack or an auto jitney could provide transportation to get you over to the park the very short distance. So 58 owners. I mean, that's telling me there are a lot of cottages out there. So the Lady Chautauqua Improvement Association did a few things to improve the grounds, and um, I'm loving this swimming pool area. Okay, they would refer to this as the swimming pool. And so basically all they did was uh, put a barrier in the lake, and that was the swimming pool area. Okay? But uh, the ladies were given credit for screening the hotel, building bridges, the bathhouse, and the bandstand. And there's another little picture of the swimming pool. Okay? Only the main part of the hotel and a few cottages remained eventually. Another article in 1928 indicated that um, the American Legion, Hilton Cottingham Post, entered into an agreement to lease the grounds, and they had plans to renovate and to make use of the tabernacle on the property, but that never happened, and so eventually everything just died down, kind of like Brown's Wells did, and, you know, it is what it is. We don't have a whole lot of those um, old... Uh, buildings and things left. We do have this. So this is a picture of the what was referred to in this postcard as the Chautauqua restaurant at the top. And then this is a current picture now of what we call the Chautauqua Park Roundhouse. And so it's just like a little meeting area that can be used. And then this is the park today. So it's, it's much different, but it's lovely. And uh, the city ended up buying the property and... Uh, and it's a lovely place. And like I said, we have this amphitheater project going in, a huge amphitheater uh, that's going to bring in a lot of attractions. So, Okay, some postcards with Old Crystal Springs, uh, which was uh, incorporated in 1823 along with the county. And then New Crystal Springs, actually we call New Crystal Springs is where Crystal Springs is today because when the railroad line came through in 1858, completed in 1858, uh, everyone moved closer to the railroad. That's what you would have done back then based on what Reverend Horton was telling us. Transportation-wise, railroads were very important during that time. And so this is one of the oldest postcards that I have. And the reason that there's so much activity here is, again, Reverend Horton referred to the vegetable shipping and so this is what they're doing they're coming to market they're selling their vegetables 
uh, it was uh, the main uh, thoroughfare here in town. And then this is a picture, a postcard of the railroad there, the depot on the right that was torn down in the 80s. And then this is another picture. This was a prosperity fair. So this is our forerunner of our tomato festival that we have today. It's the last uh, Saturday in June each year. And so this was actually one of the first um, fairs that they had was to celebrate their prosperity and their progress because the vegetable shipping was doing so well. And uh, so this was uh, a big gathering back in the, um, the early 1900s, so probably about 19... 15, 18, somewhere in there. And here's another early picture. And uh, this postcard at the bottom, I believe, is a very rare postcard. That's Georgetown Street. Very rare, the only one I've seen. Uh, and at the top, that's Front Street, one of our main streets. We do have a couple of the buildings there that, that still exist. Uh, and it's pretty neat to look at these postcards and compare uh, then and now. So I'm kind of thinking that might be my next venture. Yeah, then and now. So, Okay, and some more streets. Love looking at these old buildings. Again, these postcards are telling me what these buildings look like. I have a master's in historic preservation, so I love looking at uh, the evolution of, of the town and the buildings. Okay, and then they did some postcards called bird's eye views, which are really great because then you can try to pick out what's that building. Um, and then this is the Newton Institute, which was actually one of the first um, schools actually in the county. Um, the Newton Institute started out as a female um, type of schooling. And then we had actually the first Crystal Springs High School. This is a rare postcard. It shows me the whole building. Before that, I'd only seen the front. And so, um, so I was really glad to have this one. And then later in 1928, uh, it was replaced by the Crystal Springs, um, the High County uh, School, to name all schools that kind of did away with all the one-room schoolhouses. Uh, this was the Crystal Springs, which is now the high school, but it had all the grades at that point. And so it was consolidated school. And um, here we get to Hazelhurst, which um, when that railroad came through and completed in 1858, uh, it actually saw its beginnings. And then in 1872, the county seat was moved from Gallatin um, to Hazelhurst and the courthouse was built. And so here's some of the early buildings and streets in Hazelhurst. And the church, and this became the cover of my book, The First Baptist Church. And the church is notorious for tearing down, renovating, don't look anything like they used to. And, and so several of the postcards in the book, they'll say, that's the Baptist church. They don't look anything like the Baptist church. Well, that's what it used to look like at some point. <laughs> um, the original depot, and I didn't realize this, the original depot in Hazelhurst was actually on the east side of the railroad tracks. Had a couple of postcards of that. And then... The new depot, as they call it, which is now about 100 years old, right, um, is from 1925 and on the west side of the track. So I did not know until I started looking at these postcards that they were two different depots and that we actually had had a different depot uh, originally. So, okay, and this was the original public school in Hazelhurst. And then this is the courthouse that was built um, in 1902, replaced, uh, you know, wooden primitive type structure um, that was originally built. So love this photograph because it shows it before changes were made to it. The beautiful clock tower and all would be taken off at some point because it was leaky. Uh, the jail building was in the back at that point and you had the water tower. And so I'm going to show you pretty much what it looks like today, but now we have a lot of trees that have matured and everything. And um, just tell me if you think this looks like the same courthouse. A lot different, right? And so, yeah, you can tell the top was taken off. Uh, wings were added on the sides at some point. So a lot of changes were made, but, but that, old, um, that old original structure was just gorgeous. So. 
And then um, Lake Hazel was built um, by the city and offered, you know, to the citizens to have a place to go. So uh, that's a really early picture of the lake. And then we get on to Wesson, which uh, Reverend Horton, uh, uh, no, not Reverend Horton, I think it was Paul actually, he referred to the Wesson Mills, one of you did. And so uh, the Wesson Mills were very, very important. Wesson basically exists because of the Wesson Mills. Colonel Wesson came and wanted a place to uh, rebuild his uh, factories, his wool and cotton factories after his original um, buildings were burned uh, in North Mississippi. Um, during the Civil War. So he came to um, this area and he said, I'm going to call it Wesson and I'm going to set up all my buildings here because um, uh, at that time, actually, uh, if you look at Kapai County, you'll notice this little piece at the bottom of Kapai County kind of juts down into what looks like should be Lincoln County. Well, at the time he said, um, I do not want my factory to be in... Um, Lincoln County, because it was wet, I want it to be in a dry county, so he carved out a little spot. He made it be dry. <laughs> he went to the legislature and said, please redraw this, and they did. And so that's how he ended up in Kapai County, even though when you look at it, it goes down into Lincoln and comes back. So that's because of him. Okay, uh, But these huge buildings were built, um, multiple buildings, I mean... If we did not, if I did not have this postcard, I would not, could not imagine that these massive buildings existed in this town. Because if you drive through today, you will not see any of this. It's just absolutely amazing. Uh, this is the only building that is left of the Wesson Mills. Uh, and the modern picture there I took on the bottom. Uh, and that is the same building on the top, just a little bit different view, but the very same building. And uh, like I said, that's the only one left. And now it is like a little flea market vendor mall. Very nice. Uh, I suggest you go in there sometime. And uh, again, just thankful that we have these postcards to, to show us these things. A few other postcards from Wesson. We'll wrap it up. Uh, this is the Wesson School built in the 1890s. Uh, original one burned and then they rebuilt. It's a gorgeous building. So the postcard on the top was about 1899. The one on the bottom there is my photograph later. So gorgeous building that we are so glad we still have. And of course later, on, they stopped using that as a public school and of course built a whole new modern one, but at least we still have this one. And then the last thing, um, Kapai Lincoln Community College. So the campus is quite old. Uh, it began as an agricultural high school, as uh, several of our community colleges did. And so this is a postcard um, of the administration building, and we still have the administration building today. And so there's a current photograph on the bottom right of that building. So, so glad that we still have that. So over 100 years old. So that's wrapping up our presentation, and I'm going to ask that our other two speakers come on back up. We're going to take some questions now. Um, if you're not able to get a book today, please feel free to take down any information you'd like, and we'll be glad to get one to you. So uh, I believe that Chris has come on back up, and we'll be able to take questions from the audience. Yeah, Anybody have any questions? Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He raised his hand. You know what? I'm a teacher, so when I see a, a hand go up, that's it. So, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Um, I noticed that except in the initial presentation where you discussed the fact that apparently some enslaved people were taken by their enslavers to be part of the Confederate Army, no one here has discussed in the first 38 years of Kapai County's uh, existence what contributions to its development enslaved people made. I do note from, uh, uh, from some archives things that Kapai County went, by 1860, it had almost as many enslaved people as white people, and there was also something I didn't know till the archives told me this, a slave market in Crystal Springs. In your studies about Kapai County, what have you learned? And did the people who had formerly been enslaved remain in Kapai County or leave after the war? 
I'll talk about a little bit of a, about that. Um, there is a, a particular instance where Jesse Thompson uh, was an early settler in Kapai County, and he had a trained um, uh, black American gentleman that worked for him. The, the name has not made it through the bounds of history, but he built the original uh, courthouse building at Cora Springs, and then when the the courthouse ended up in Gallatin. He also built that particular building, which um, <clears throat> there were two at Gallatin. One was wooden, and then a later, a brick one was built to try to keep the county seat at Gallatin. But, um, you know, along with that, you know, there were many of the early houses, uh, Lowe's Wells, for instance. A lot of those buildings were built by craftsmen that or enslaved uh, under various owners, but um, you know there's you know many you know various instances. But um, uh, what was the second part of your question? My mind doesn't. Oh, uh, settlement after the war did the formal. Did they stay there? Did, a lot of them did the formerly Some. enslaved people who had lived in Kapai County before uh, uh, emancipation, did they remain in Kapai County or did they leave and settle elsewhere? Um, that's, some of that is mentioned in my book, but according to a bunch of newspaper accounts, there's a somewhat of a shift uh, after emancipation. A, a lot of them may have moved north there's not any, you know, kind of details, but the population um, changed, um, like in the 1870s census. But some did remain because, you know, tying back many family names, I can attribute those names to uh, modern day, um, you know, many, many, many various county black family names that you can directly connect backwards if you go through all the sources, but fortunately, Kapai has most of its records. Um, there were never any fires or anything, and so you can do a great deal of deed research or research on houses um, and lots of other, you know, various records there in the, in the chancery or the circuit court, for instance, but uh, um, you can dig and find a, a wonder of stuff in the indexes which you know, I've done over the years, but I know the current uh, retiring uh, chancery clerk is in the process of, uh, he's trying to compile a list of slaves out of deeds for people to use for research. I'm not sure where that project is, but. I've got a couple of questions. What is the origin of the name Kapaya? County, and secondly, do the springs still have medicinal qualities? And do people live long lives there? <laughs> so okay, so Kapaya comes from um, Native American calling panther, and uh, we do actually have a calling panther uh, lake now, and so that's what uh, Kapaya came from, Native American name, as a lot of names in uh, Mississippi came from, and um, and the springs. So uh, we have uh, Crystal Springs, which I mentioned Old Crystal Springs. So Old Crystal Springs is as old as the county itself, was very early settlement, originally um, with a settlement called Sweetwater. And so there were actually springs there at the time. Those were not said to be medicinal. They were just some springs. And you know, a lot of people would move and make sure that they had a water source. And so uh, that's how Old Crystal Springs began. Uh, and then, of course, moved to the railroad for New Crystal Springs. But as far as Browns Wells, any medicinal waters, I would surely like to know because if there are, I need some. <laughs> so, uh, not sure about the medicinal quality of the water. <laughs> uh, what was the reason for the decline of the vegetables uh, market and everything? Uh, there was a big deal there, and now it's not. A couple of things. Uh, I'll start. <clears throat> a couple of factors. One was uh, competition from other markets. There were a number of different areas of the country 
uh, that were producing vegetables. And the people who could get them done the quickest and get them to major markets like Chicago made the most money. And if you were later on, then you got the, uh, the lower priced uh, goods, you know. So that's one reason, uh, competition. And uh, then there was a tomato blight that came through. That hurt them some. And then World War II, which changed so many things, kind of put the last nail in the coffin. Uh, but there's still a tomato, uh, well, vegetable market type. Mississippi State has a, a group here that still studies in that. What's that called? The truck crops? Yeah. Experiment station? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we, we're, they're still studying uh, you know, various types of uh, crops here in, in our county. We appreciate having them present. An another aspect to this was transportation. Um, in a couple of my studies for the Hazelhurst truck farming book, uh, in the 1930s it talks a great deal about people using transportation large trucks to take, um, you know, cabbage to uh, New Orleans to sell instead of using the railroad, and so that changed um, some of the aspects to it. But uh, about 35 is when things started to go south, but they continue to have truck farming in Kapai County, I think, as far as I can tell, through the 50s and 60s, there are still farmers. And even today, there are people who um, grow a large scale uh, thing, the Rutledge Farms, and there are people that grow a great deal of tomatoes still. So. Yes. Um you know, you had all of these so-called healthful wells down in Papaya County, and just a few miles west of here, we had Cooper's Well in Hines County. How did they determine that the water was supposed to be healthy, or was that just a, you know, was that just something just somebody advertised? I think one of the, the stickier the water, the better, you know, health benefits. <laughs> That's my theory. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I have one of the Browns wells. Uh, brochures, and I think somewhere in there there are percentages of various minerals that are in the water. Yeah. Um, but there's a multitude of material on um, on definitely Brown's Well. <laughs> yeah, and the mineral content, have you? Yes. While driving in Kapaya County, I had to detour on a back road, and an animal crossed the road. And my passenger said, did you see that panther? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I understand there, was, there is a panther lake in Copaya County. Calling panther. Calling my panther. question is, was that a real panther? Do you yeah. still have them running around? Uh, maybe. <laughs> oh, I, I can tell you for sure that there are because uh, my wife's family owned a lot of property on Highway 28 that's, you know, within a mile of the original town of Gallatin. But back in all the property between the now Highway 28 and Old Port Gibson Road is a great deal of, of still of, uh, pine land. And uh, through there, many times they have caught in headlights uh, panthers. So there are some still deep in the woods in Kapai County, so I'm not surprised that you ran across one. <laughs> Our friends down the hill at the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks have a different answer. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> but it's fun to think about. Any other questions? Trisha on postcards, it usually has personalized writings on the back. Did you find any really interesting statements on the back of these postcards? That's a great question. I enjoy reading the, the postcards. Sometimes I buy a postcard uh, and I know somebody thinks, why would you buy that postcard? Because of who it was sent to, who it was sent from, or what it said. And so, you know, uh, they tried to get as much as they could on those little postcards. and. Uh, you know, in their cursive writing, sometimes it's really hard to read. They're really faded. I'm getting my magnifying glass out. I'm really studying it, you know. Um, they weren't able to say a whole lot in that little space. Uh, so I haven't found anything, um, you know, uh, too informative. But I think it's more about 
um, sometimes finding somebody who you know is a prominent citizen and that's their handwriting, you know, and, and so that's, that's what I really enjoy about that. Sometimes find that little hidden gem like that. So that's a good question though. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you all for being thank with you. us. Uh, don't forget about our programs that we have coming up. Don't forget to come back next week for History's Launch when we'll screen the documentary from our old friend Mark LaFrancis. Uh, and we have copies of the Kapai County Historic Postcards book from Tricia for sale, along with the Shared History Kapai County, Mississippi, 1823-2023 by all three and other contributors. Help me thank Paul Cartwright, Tricia Nelson, and Gene Horton for this program today.